Amen. So try, if you could, to recall the last fairly large traditional wedding that you last attended. It was like a lot of weddings. Uh, there was this high sense of anticipation leading up to it. So much effort had gone into the planning, and now, at last, the time had finally come. As people filter into the church or into the room, you can, you can just sense this growing level of energy. People greet one another and smile at one another. There's this sort of happy murmuring that fills the room. Then the family is seated. And next come the come the groom and the groomsman and the minister. After that comes the bridal party with everybody's hair and makeup and nails just perfect. Been there, haven't I? Yeah, I don't know where that came from, but I, you knew what I'm talking about. And at that point, when the bridal party is all in, people can't help themselves. Their heads began to swivel, looking back, hoping to get that first glimpse of the bride. Suddenly, the volume on the music goes up. And everybody in the room stands up. And down the aisle comes the beautiful bride, along with the poor father who's trying to hold it all together. Weddings are so cool in just so many ways. But most of all, you know what happens at a wedding? It's a miracle. It's a miracle of God. Two people are joined and become one in the eyes of God. And that's the greatest thing of all about any wedding. Well, I would bet you that 75% of the weddings that I have done myself or have, have been to, there's one passage that shows up most of the time. And it's the one we read earlier, it's this. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. What a beautiful passage to read at a wedding. In fact, that passage right there is often referred to as the love passage. But you know what? Those words weren't written to people who are getting married. No, those words were written to Christians. Christians living in a town called Corinth and they happened to be Christians who really had no idea what it meant to live their lives as a Christian. Oh, they claimed to be Christians, but they didn't really act like it. I'm sure you've never met anybody like that, although I do hear there's some out there. And by the way, this is free. Did you know that the, the biggest reason that people and mostly young people reject Christianity and say, no mas, not for me, thank you, it's good for you, that's fine, but not for me, is because there are so many Christians who do not act like Christians. They may claim to say they're Christians, but they don't act like Christians. It's too bad. Well, over the past few weeks, we've been doing a, a sermon series called uh, Meals with Jesus. Now, obviously, Jesus was a very friendly, social person, 
And he really loved spending time with people lots of different ways, but especially at table over food. And more often than not, Jesus would use these occasions as an opportunity to teach people things they needed to know. Well, there was one meal, though, that was different. Um, it was Thursday night, and Jesus would be crucified, nailed to a cross to pay the penalty for the sin of the world in only a few hours. And so before that happened, Jesus needed to give his disciples a number of last minute instructions. This was a long emotional night. And throughout the night, there was one word that popped up repeatedly over and over and over again. And that word was love. Well, this morning we are going to consider Jesus teaching that night on love. What did he say? What did he mean? What does it feel like? And along the way, we're going to see how that passage, that love passage, found in so many weddings, how that really is intended to work. Okay? Let's take a look. So do me a favor, if you would, uh, play along with me. Um, let's try a little experiment, okay? Um, raise your right hand. Some of you know which is right, okay. Um, now raise your other right hand. That would be your left hand. Okay, good. You can put those down. All right, now feel love. Mm, mm. Yeah, you get it. I mean... One of those is harder than the other, um, and that was feeling love. You know, it's one thing to do something physically, um, but feelings are different. I mean, I can raise my right hand on demand, but I'm unable to love on demand. Maybe you can, but I can't. Which makes one of the things that Jesus said that night in that upper room, one of the things he told his disciples kind of hard to understand. He said this, he said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Um, now we have to remember who he was talking to, who was in the room with him that night. And let me just remind you that those guys were not really a band of brothers. It wasn't like, oh, I got your back, bro. All for one, one for all. It wasn't like that. No, all of those guys, except for Judas, all of those guys would ultimately be deemed saints. But as of that night, they were not saints. As of that night, no church would have been named after any of those guys. The fact of the matter is, the people in that room that night weren't necessarily even friends. See, within the 12 disciples, uh, there were rivalries, and there was political maneuvering and, and ambition. Who's going to be the greatest among us? Well, I am, of course. No, I am. No, it's me. It's not far-fetched to imagine that some of the people in that room just didn't like one another. Well, Jesus was savvy enough to, to understand that, and, and he had to fix it before he returned to the Father. So he said, okay, guys, just love one another. I mean, that's kind of what it looks like there. But we all know that you can't force love, at least not feelings of love. We can raise our hand on demand, but we can't love on demand. 
So what was Jesus saying? Well, what if, what if Jesus wasn't talking so much about love as this warm, fuzzy feeling, but something else? Well, that might, that might make more sense. What if the love that Jesus was talking about wasn't a feeling of all, at all, but rather a decision, a decision that leads to action? Hmm. Now, there's a thought. Some of y'all probably know this already, but the Greek language has several words that are translated into love. So there's, uh, there's a word for romantic love, and there's a, lo- a word for friendship love. Um, and then there's this word. It's a big word. See how big it is? Um, it's, it's the word agape. And agape is the word that Jesus used when he told his disciples to love Some of y'all got that about the big word, didn't you? Or maybe some of y'all are just getting, anyway. Agape is the word that Jesus used uh, when he told his disciples to love one another. And you see, the word agape isn't a feeling. It's not like romantic love. It's not like friendship love or, 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 or the love we might share with our family. In fact, agape isn't a feeling at all. C.S. Lewis, scholar, said, Agape is not affectionate feeling, but a steady wish for the loved person's ultimate good as far as it can be obtained. Let me say that again. Agape is not affectionate feeling, but a steady wish for the loved person's ultimate good as far as it can be obtained. So agape is wanting the best for someone else and then trying to bring it to pass, to do something about it. And that is what Jesus told his disciples. Those guys didn't need to like each other. That wasn't the point. But they did need to love each other, which meant that they had to take care of each other. And just to clarify things a bit more, to make sure they understood it, he said this. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. Jesus was was the model. Jesus uh, was the example. He wasn't saying, you got to feel a certain way. You're don't have to feel like I feel, but you do have to do what I do. But wait, there's more. Then he upped the ante, really big, 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 big. He said this, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. That's what he said to his disciples. He said, y'all got to be willing to die for one another. And don't you know that the guys in the room that night, their minds had to have been blown. Here's what I mean. So these are the guys. And one of the guys in that room with Jesus was named Matthew. And maybe you remember that Matthew, before he became a follower of Jesus, was a tax collector. Now, the thing about tax collectors is they were crooks. Um, what, the way it worked is Rome didn't collect taxes. They farmed it out to locals. And the locals would pay Rome all of the tax money, and then they would they, the tax collector, would collect the money from the citizens. And as they did that, they were able to collect more than they were supposed to. And everybody knew that. And everybody hated the tax collectors. But what made matters worse is that the tax collectors, they were Jewish. Um, 
they were extorting money from other Jewish people, their own people, in order to finance the hated Roman occupation. And they were getting rich. They, the tax collectors, were getting rich in the process. In Israel, there was no lower life form than a tax collector. That being the case, I have trouble believing that when Matthew joined the disciples, everybody welcomed him with open arms. <laughs> High five. Welcome, bro. I have trouble believing that. And I also have trouble believing that even three years later, there wasn't some lingering um, suspicion and animosity. When Jesus said that all the men in that upper room had to love one another, as Jesus loved, that is they had to leave, love each other sacrificially, even to the point of death, it's easy for me to imagine that some of those guys kind of glanced over at Matthew and thought, I'll do it for everybody but him. But Jesus didn't give them that option. They didn't give him that choice. Uh, look at his words again. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Jesus didn't leave any wiggle room. There are no exceptions. Don't Try looking for loopholes because there are none. Agape love is a commandment, period. Jesus' followers are to do agape, even if they don't feel like it, even for people they don't like. So zooming forward a bit for us today, that would include our friends, our families, our neighbors, our enemies, our employers, our employees, our teachers, um, people on the Katy Freeway. <laughs> that struck a chord. Um, people with different political views, young people. Old people, uh, people with different skin color, people from different countries, tall people, short people, smart people, dumb people, people who deserve it and people who don't deserve it. I could go on and on, but I think you get the point. As Christians, we are to agape. That is, we are to want the best for each and every person on the planet, regardless of who they are. And then, we are to seek to make the best happen for that person, even if, it co if it's costly, even to the point of our own death. Agape is a big ask, except it's not an ask. Agape is a command. Which brings us back to that love passage, which is so often read at, at weddings. You remember how it begins? It starts, love is blah, blah, blah. And, and, of course, by now you figured out that that word in Greek is, is agape, which is the very same word we've been talking about. It's the word that Jesus used uh, that night in the upper room. And you remember what was going on when this love passage was written. It, it wasn't written to people getting married. It was written to Christians who, um, it was written as a training tool for Christians who, had not yet perfected their Christian behavior. 
And so I wonder, I wonder if we couldn't use it that way too. So I'd invite you to participate in yet another little experiment. Early on, we, we learned that um, we can do certain actions on demand. On the other hand, when it comes to feelings, not so much. Of course, agape isn't a feeling. So let's see how we are, how good we are at agape. Now to do that, if you'll go along with me, we're going to do a self-check kind of thing. We'll call it an agape check as we go through the love passage. And uh, to make it harder on you, I'm going to ask you to think of somebody you really don't like. Maybe the person you like least in life. Let's see how you do. Agape is patient. Agape is kind. Agape does not envy. Agape does not boast. Agape is not arrogant. Agape is not rude. Agape does not insist on its own way. Agape is not irritable. Agape is not resentful. Agape does not rejoice at wrongdoing. Agape bears all things. Agape believes all things. Agape hopes all things. Agape endures all things. So how did you do? I mean, obviously, that's not an all-inclusive list. It's, agape is much bigger than this. This is sort of just kind of entry-level stuff, to be honest. But it's a start. Now, if you are like me, there's plenty of room for improvement. I definitely have work to do. But I have to do that work. I do. I don't have a choice. Agape is not optional. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. <laughs> yep. I do have some work I need to do. How about you? Amen. Now, if you would, please 